Welcome to Dr. Karen Speaks Leadership, the show for you, the successful, savvy, senior business leader. Featuring the music of national recording artist, Ron McMillan, and I am your host, Dr. Karen wilson Stark. In today's workplace, we are facing a season right now where very many people are facing job loss or job insecurity. And in some cases, businesses have closed because of the pandemic and some of the challenges involved in keeping the business open. And in other cases, because of vaccine mandates that have come online in recent weeks, Some people are opting not to get vaccinated, which does impact whether they'll be able to continue in their current employment. We are seeing many people in hospital work and healthcare who are opting to leave their jobs and leave their roles because of the vaccine mandate. And many of those people will not be eligible for unemployment. So we are really facing a crisis when we think about what might happen to people in terms of their job opportunity. So with that in mind, it's a good time to be in the workplace again as a person who can encourage others who are walking through a very difficult season with respect to their job and their job choices. Here's the thing to keep in mind. Each person will make a decision based on their own individual circumstances and the circumstances of their family and what they think is best for them and what they think is best for their family. And of course, there are consequences to all of those decisions. So in some cases, they may no longer be able to work in the current place where they are working. And what is important to remember and to share with people is that with every crisis that they face, And every crisis that comes along, there will at the same time be an opportunity that they can leverage, an opportunity that they can create. In most cases, you won't necessarily see that opportunity right away. It can take some time before you get a chance to see it. Though it is true that as some doors close, other doors will open. So you want to be able to provide people with information and alternative perspectives from what they may be thinking and to serve as a sounding board as they're going through what feels like an insecure time. And they may be wondering, how are we going to pay our mortgage? How are we going to get food? How are we going to do many things they may be wondering about? And I'll say this, sometimes it may seem that the circumstances are such that we've been forced to leave when we might have chosen not to leave at that particular time. And what I would say is that everything happens for a reason, and there's a grander narrative to each person's life. Many people have come back to a workplace, for example, after having been terminated and fired, and they'll say to that boss, it was the best thing that ever happened to me, or because a job may have closed down or something has shifted and they had to create a new way. And again, they come back and say, I never would have stepped out like that. I never would have created what I created had it not been forced in some ways by the circumstances. So I'll just share something personal. I remember some years ago, I was working for an organization And one day I was coming back from lunch and I was approaching the building. And as I was walking up the driveway and towards the front door of this workplace where I worked, I had the strong sensation that I wouldn't be working there very much longer. 
there was no reason for me to think that. And yet the thought came to my mind. And I thought, well, that's strange. It was one of those insights that you don't just shake out of your mind. I certainly didn't shake it out of my mind. I filed it away and said, there must be a reason why that came to me. And I just thought about it. At the moment, that's all I heard. There was nothing that said, pack your bags and leave today. So I didn't. And I continued working there as I had been all along. Not long after that, there was a person who was hired, who was to be my boss or supervisor on this job. And it just so happened that this person was very unskilled in leadership, very unskilled in management, and didn't know how to talk to people at all. It was a really drastic situation. And I thought to myself, I don't have to take this. There's no reason for me to stay as a professional person and be treated with this level of disrespect. And so I made efforts to have conversations with this person about what would be more appropriate and what I would appreciate. And at the same time, they continued in their level of disrespect. Simultaneously, what was also going on is that my husband was on a military assignment that was off-site and in a different state from where I was living at the time. And my mother was also far away, about 1,800 miles away, and she was seriously ill with a long-term illness. In both cases, I needed to have the flexibility on my job to travel by plane to visit my husband about once a month, to travel by plane to visit my mother once a month to help relieve my brother who had the day-to-day burden of taking care of her and to give him relief once a month. And the job that I had was a a six-day-a-week job, wasn't very flexible, and it was difficult to plan ahead because my schedule could be changed at a moment's notice. And of course, when you're planning flights, and this was years ago when flights were even less flexible in terms of planning, that was a very difficult thing to do. So I realized that a number of circumstances had converged, which said, now is the time to go. And so I tendered my resignation from that organization, although I had not been planning to do anything of the sort. And I remembered back to that day when I was coming from lunch and I got that message, you won't be working here for very much longer. So just keep in mind that always there's an element of faith that is a part of these circumstances. And we can't always see that far down the road to find out what else is going to happen or why this might be in our best interest or to our benefit. And I'm thinking about Moses when after killing the Egyptian, he left Egypt because he couldn't stay there any longer. His life was certainly in danger after killing the Egyptian. He didn't know exactly where he was going. He just knew he had to leave the home that he was raised in. He finds himself in the land of Midian, and as I call it, on the backside of the desert. And he was there for 40 years, which is a long time. And during that time that he was on the backside of the desert, he had gotten married. He had had a couple of sons. And God is perfecting in him his shepherding ability and is preparing him for the day when he would bring him back to Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of Egyptian slavery and into the promised land. I'm sure when he left Egypt, he wasn't imagining how his story really would unfold. He couldn't see that many steps down the pathway, nor do we usually see all of those steps down the pathway either. So you really won't know how it's all going to work out in advance. What does happen is that you do get confirmation along the way. So even that message as I was coming back from lunch was a piece of the message that I was supposed to get. And then later, after I had resigned, and I'm my first week in the new business that I had set up at that time, At that time, fax machines were still a big deal. I had just installed the fax machine into my office. No one knew my number. I hadn't given it to anyone. I received a fax that was telling me about a job opportunity. And the way it all played out, I said, you know what? 
God, you even know where I am right now and in this season of my life. And even though in my mind, no one knows my fax number, the first day the fax machine is set up, I get a message. And it was just reassurance to me that I see you. I haven't forgotten you the same as I've provided for you up till now. I will continue to do even as you move forward in your life. And you want to remember the same is also true for you as well. And you can share these kinds of lessons and insights with those in the workplace. And you can share with them some of your own stories of how God has brought you through many circumstances and scenarios and changes in the workplace that you weren't pursuing or even expecting at the time. In my personal case in leaving that employer, another bonus that came out of it was that I ended up unexpectedly having an opportunity to provide some contracted services back to that employer as I was establishing my new direction in a forward way. That was not something that was known that would happen. It wasn't something that they had previously tended to do in the past, and yet that was an opportunity that I had. So you don't know, again, what additional doors will open or what opportunities you will have as you move forward into the future. Nevertheless, even as we move through all of these things, there are some emotions to conquer and some emotions to deal with and to get over. And some of those might be fear or anxiety. And here's what I want you to know about fear and anxiety. When you're in fear and when you're in anxiety, it actually constricts your mindset and constricts your creativity. So even if the open doors were all around you, you might not see them from a state of fear or a state of anxiety. So it's very important to remember the power of operating from a position of hope in a position of possibility, reminding yourself of the stories in your own life when you've gotten through some difficult circumstances. And if you're talking to someone in the workplace, getting them to reflect in their own lives when they've had to take some difficult steps and it all worked out in the end, although at the beginning it seemed daunting and as though it would not work out. And if someone doesn't have those stories, by all means, share other stories with them from other people or share your own so that they know it is possible to get through a season of challenge of this magnitude. I remember in 2008, when we had the financial crisis, and particularly it was global, but it was particularly severe in the United States, And on a particular day, and I remember this very vividly, it was Veterans Day in 2008. Everything that I had booked for 2009 canceled on that day. Every client called and said, we're no longer going to do this. We're no longer going to do that. Cancel, cancel, cancel. And typically, I had been booked up at least a year in advance. And now here I am not knowing what I'm even going to do the next month, let alone in the next year. I had no idea how I would get through 2008, how I would get through 2009. And it took quite a while to rebuild the business after all of these scenarios occurred. However, I did rebuild the business and it was stronger on the back end than it had been on the front end because of what I learned and going through this crisis, and also what I put in place as greater cushions of safety for the next time. So when the pandemic hit, and I had to go from 80% on the road to 100% virtual, I remembered the lessons from 2008. I was not passive. I didn't sit around and wait for anything to happen. I started creating the new business and what I wanted to see happen in this new season. So when you have people in your workplace who are going through a season like this, they too can take charge of their own lives and create a pathway forward if they keep the hope and if they keep the optimism and the possibility mindset top of mind and 
as part of the scenario going forward. So I want us to remember several things today. And one is, I want us to think about something that the psalmist said in Psalm 37, 25. And this is David sort of reflecting on his life and he's gotten to the latter part of his life and he's remembering what he's seen over the years. So this is Psalm, the 37th chapter, starting with verse 23. And it says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. So what I want us to remember in these verses is that whatever steps you're taking, If you belong to God, those steps are ordered by God. He knows your next step, your every step. Nothing is surprising to him. And though you have a challenge now, though you may fall down, you will get back up. You won't be forsaken. You won't be abandoned. And even as David says, he's never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. He's not saying that you won't have hard times or that you might not even have to ask for a crust of bread. He is saying though, that when you do, God will provide. If you have to beg, you will receive. Whereas someone who's wicked, they may beg all day and they may not receive anything. And it doesn't mean that you won't be poor. You might be poor in this life. And yet at the same time, God is with you. You are not abandoned. So there's a lot of hope in these verses when we think about it from that point of view, because it is the righteous who are going to inherit the land. And so we can take some solace in that. I also want to share with you reflection and reading from the new covenant. That's also very powerful. And this comes from Matthew, the sixth chapter, because we want to know that God knows in advance and already everything that we need nothing takes him by surprise. So in Matthew, the sixth chapter, he's reminding people not to worry about food, shelter, and clothing. And this is how it reads. He says, therefore, I say to you, and this is Jesus speaking, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So let's keep that in mind. If we are focused on God and where he is leading us and what's important is his agenda for our lives, 
He will do all the worrying about food, shelter, and clothing. And guess what? He's not worried about it because he stands ready and prepared to provide. Sometimes we may not always think about it. However, there really is a place for prayer, even in the workplace. In times past, people have lamented over issues such as, oh, they've taken prayer out of the schools and so on and so forth. The truth is no one can take prayer away from you because it's a very private matter between you and God, or it can be. Of course, there are corporate prayers and there are also private prayers. So they can be said silently to yourself. No one even has to know that you are praying. So it really can't be removed if you really think about it, if you have the heart and mind to pray. And in today's time, when we think about the workplace, there's so much that we really could pray over. And in fact, that we might need to pray over in order for things to work out more favorably. And one of the things I just want to remind us of and to think about is the fact that the, there's a warfare that's going on here on the earth. And the warfare is not physical. It's rather a spiritual warfare. And before things change and shift and happen differently down here in the natural, there are often shifts that have to happen at the spiritual level first. And so I want to first read out of Ephesians 6, just so we get a sense of the spiritual battle that's going on. Ephesians 6, starting with verse 10, and it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So here's this picture that there are principalities, there are powers, there are rulers of darkness, and that those principalities, powers, and rulers are actually living in heavenly places, meaning in a spiritual realm. They may be working through people, however, they have their origin elsewhere. And I'll remind you that even Daniel, back in his day, he was thinking about the fact that God had prophesied that there should only be a certain period of time for the people of Israel to be in captivity. And he recognized that the time was near when the captivity should be over. And he had been praying about, you know, all the things that he was becoming aware of and wanting to find out what he should do. And what was interesting is that when he was answered in his prayer, he was told by the messenger of God who came to him that even from the beginning that he started to pray, things were starting to move around and yet there was opposition. So I want to read this a little bit. This is Daniel, the 10th chapter and verse 12. And he says, then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. So Daniel had been praying to God, God was listening, and some things were moving around in the heavenlies. And now God's messenger comes to speak to Daniel and say, your prayers have been heard, and things have been happening. There's been some, in essence, warfare, even going up in the, on up in the heavenlies 
on your behalf. And because you have sought the counsel of the Lord, he will reveal to you what is going to happen in the future. So I say all of this to say that sometimes we get stuck in what we can see on this earth and we forget that there's also an invisible realm and that a lot also goes on in the invisible realm. And that's where prayer really comes in. So as a minimum, there are at least three levels of prayer that are necessary in the workplace. First of all, for individual people and their circumstances. And in recent weeks, we've talked about situations like people going through bereavement, people going through serious illness of family members or friends, people who may be losing jobs and so on. There are many reasons to pray for people and individuals and their circumstances and for God's wisdom to prevail, for them to get direction for God to be Jehovah Rapha, the healer in their life. So many needs that we have on the individual level, and you can be an intercessor, someone who prays on behalf of individuals. Secondly, you can also pray for business leaders. Many decisions need to be made in the workplace right now, and leaders need wisdom about the decisions that they're facing. What decisions would be best for people, for the business, and for the future, and for what God has in mind to accomplish through that business. And even if those business leaders are not people of God and not believers themselves, we know when we take a look at how God dealt with Israel over the years, many times they were under captivity in foreign lands where people didn't acknowledge God. And they cried out to God and he listened to them and he heard them and he intervened on behalf of his people. Which brings to the third level too, which is praying for government leaders, whether local, national or worldwide. Because again, people are making decisions that impact the people of God. So we want to keep those things before the Lord and he stands there waiting to hear from us so that he can begin to move. And we can see in history, he moved a lot of the king's hearts on behalf of his people when they lifted up prayers to him. And I'm remembering specifically in the case of Queen Esther and her husband, King Ahasuerus, when wicked Haman had concocted a plan that would end up exterminating the Jewish people out of the kingdom. And Queen Esther had not been summoned by the king. And of course, if you went to the king unsummoned, you could be killed. We've talked about this before. She declared three days of a fast. So Mordecai, her cousin, had all the Jews to fast on her behalf. She and her maids, they also fasted and prayed to God for three days before she went to the king un announced and took her life into her hands and God gave her favor. The king held out the scepter, which preserved her life. And he was delighted to hear whatever it is that she wanted. And she prepared a couple dinners as a way of unfolding the circumstances of the Jewish people at that time. And God allowed a way of escape and prepared a way of escape for them. So certainly praying for people and for business leaders in the decision-making and government leaders, local, national, and worldwide is important. Sometimes we're going to pray for people. Those people may not be aware of it. They may not be there. They may have asked us to pray for them. And then there are other times when we might also pray with people. And there's real benefit in praying with people as they hear you lift up their petitions to God and have a conversation with God. What I have noticed is that many times, even the peace of God that reigns in you, the believer, gets transmitted to them as part of that prayer. They understand that God is moving and God is listening, and they can be put into a different emotional place as a result. So there's real power in praying with people. Thirdly, if there are other believers in your workplace and there's something really going on that's affecting the business, affecting the country, you can get together with other believers and have a time of corporate prayer where all of you come together to lift up concerns and petitions to God, to ask for guidance and direction and wisdom. 
just as Daniel was asking for guidance and wisdom and direction and discernment and understanding. And although God did not come right away with the answer, he certainly did come and send the answer to Daniel in his circumstance and situation. And we know from Matthew, the 18th chapter and verse 20, that where two or three are gathered together in my name, the Lord says, there I am in the midst of them. So there is true power in corporate prayer as well. Keep in mind that sometimes we don't know what to pray for people. And that's okay, because God knows what those people need. We just need to intercede, lift them up before God. And it's the Holy Spirit who resides in us, who intercedes on behalf of those people, and who prays with groans sometimes that are unintelligible to us. But God understands them, knows what the Holy Spirit is saying, and the Holy Spirit knows what that person might require and might need. It's the Spirit who helps us in our time of weakness. And I want to share a verse related to that too, because just so we know that God is taking care of everything, even when we don't know something, he knows it. So Romans 8, verses 26 and 27 says, Likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. That's amazing. It says, now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So as you pray for people, pray for the will of God in their lives. Pray for the blessing of God in their lives. And God knows what that translates into. Pray for his perfect will for them. The same as we would pray, as in the Lord's Prayer, that God's will be done on earth, even as it's done in heaven. Sometimes we will pray for the strength of people that we're praying for, their peace and their and guidance and their guidance as they're going through a variety of circumstances. And the bottom line is, remember that if we don't pray, James the fourth chapter tells us that you have not because you ask not. And sometimes we're also asking with wrong motives, and that may be another reason why we don't have something. But the point is, God has provided this conversation, this fellowship with him through prayer, that we can ask for the things that we need and receive them from him as well. So as we close on this subject today, I would like to share with you Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses six through seven. Here's what the verses say. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So there's no need to be anxious about anything. Lift up all of your supplications, your cares and concerns in prayer with thanksgiving, being thankful but what God has already done and what he's already doing and the peace of God that passes even our understanding is what will rest and abide with us. So be willing to be that intercessor at work. Understand that the battle is spiritual and we will intercede on behalf of our colleagues, our workplace, our country, our city, our world, in the heavenly realm. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8, 28. This is an important thing to keep in mind that all things work together for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. And that doesn't mean that everything that happens to you is good. However, God will take even those challenging and difficult things that happen and turn it for our good. And for this reason, 
We have hope. There are reasons for hope. And that's what we're talking about today. Reasons for hope that can be shared with people in the workplace. A couple other things I'll just reference and mention is that, you know, God says that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. And that's an important promise to keep in mind. A lot of our hope really is resident in the promises of God. So in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, if we will take a look at verses five and six, it says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And imagine that if the God of the universe is your helper, of whom do you need to be afraid? Even if people believe they can do something to you, everything is still filtered through the hands of God's love and his permissions. And ultimately, God still works it out for our good. So that's just good news. And that's also hopeful news for us to keep in mind. Even Jesus, when he was given his disciples their commission about going out and preaching to all of the nations of the world and letting them know what God was saying, he told them, he says, I will be with you even until the end of the age. So again, you're not alone. And the psalmist in Psalm 23, 4 says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So no matter what the circumstances are that we go through, God is right there with us. He won't leave us alone. We have him with us, even as we're walking through the valley in the shadow of death. And if we remember, even in Psalm 139, David says, where can I go from your spirit? No matter where I go, there you are, God. So there's no place that we can go where God is not. That alone should give us reason for hope as well. Keep in mind that when the Lord is present, there's also peace in the storm. It doesn't mean there won't be storms. There will be storms. And you can have peace in the midst of those storms. I recall the time when Jesus' disciples were on the boat and the sea was raging and they were fearful and afraid and he was asleep, not even concerned about the weather. They woke him up and they said, don't you care that we're perishing? And he gets up and he just says to the winds and the waves, peace be still and everything calm down. And they were kind of shocked and they were amazed. Well, who is this that can calm seas and waves and so on. He wasn't worried about it because if you're God, you have charge even over nature and things that normally would be frightening to the rest of us. In another situation, the disciples were in a small boat and they were out on the sea and Jesus was walking on the water. And of course, when they saw him, they didn't know who he was. They thought it was a ghost on the water and they were quite afraid. And he told them, and they, and they were rowing the boat in such a way that the wind was against them. And so he told them, don't worry, don't be afraid. It's just me. He steps into the boat. And as soon as he stepped in the boat, everything calmed down. And that's how our lives are. There could be turbulence all around, so much going on. And as soon as we allow God to step in to our circumstances, that's when we receive that peace that passes all understanding because we have supernatural help on board with us, not just our earthly resources. You know, I'm thinking back to some times in the past when there were circumstances in my life that were not good circumstances. They were challenging and difficult circumstances of loss. And yet what I recall and what I remember seeing in each of these circumstances, I could see the presence of God and how he had me where he wanted me to be at the right time and doing what I needed to do at the time. So I'm going to share with you just briefly about three deaths in my family that I experienced and how I saw hope in the circumstances. In one case, it was just 
about a week before Christmas this particular year. And I had just flown in to Baltimore where my family lives. And my husband and I had gone shopping and we had bought all of these wonderful gifts for our great nephew, who was the first great nephew in the family. Everybody was excited about him. He was the first grandchild for my sister, the first great grandchild for my parents. And he was loved, you know, by everyone. And so we had bought all kinds of gifts for him for Christmas. And I had those in my suitcase. And so I arrived late at night. And before I could wake up the next morning, I learned that he had been killed. This little baby, he had been killed. He was less than two years old. It was such a shock. It was a horrible crisis, you know, for my family to go through that particular loss. And I understood that I was there with them, flown in just the night before, just in time to be there because my sister was completely beside herself, just inconsolable grief over the loss of her grandchild. And so during the time that I was there, and since it was Christmas, this made it even worse. This Christmas had a pall over it that year uh, with the baby dying at that time. And his funeral was maybe two days before Christmas. So what I'm saying is I knew that I had been sent there to provide that comfort and encouragement for my family. And so that we would all be together and not be alone as we were walking through that season of tremendous loss and that season of tremendous grief. So that's one example. A second example is when my maternal grandmother died. And I didn't know that my maternal grandmother was sick unto death. And I didn't obviously know she was going to die, but I flew in again you know, to Baltimore on this particular occasion. It was in January. There was a big, huge snowstorm that emerged. When I got to Baltimore, I realized that she was in the hospital. And the snowstorm was of such a magnitude that we really couldn't move around. You couldn't really drive under the weather conditions. And I arrived just in time because everybody was confused about what the doctors were saying in her case. And so I got on the phone, talked to the doctors at the hospital and really learned of the dire circumstances. My grandmother was in the last days and hours of her life. And I had not known that before I arrived. And so then I had to explain, you know, to the rest of the family members, what her medical conditions were, what the options and choices were and what was going to happen. And at this point, they were only keeping her alive in case somebody wanted to come by and say their goodbyes. And that's the circumstances we were in. Most people could not get to the hospital. However, some were able to make it there during the blizzard and were able to say goodbye. But again, I was there at the time for my mother and to comfort her through these circumstances and to help her to plan the funeral for my grandmother. Because at that time, my mother was then disabled and in a wheelchair and had a number of physical challenges. And so for me, being her oldest child and daughter to come in to help was certainly useful and necessary at the time. And then the third one I'll mention is when my mother died herself. On this particular incident, I had been at a client that was in Northern Virginia. And so I said, oh, well, since I'll be coming to Northern Virginia to work with them, I'll stop in Baltimore and visit the family. And so I had planned to visit the family on the front end of the trip, which is the opposite of usually how I work. I normally would visit the family on the back end of a business trip. But in this case, I was going to visit first. Had the flight already planned. And before I could get to Baltimore, the client reduced the meeting from in-person to a telephone conference, which obviously I could have stayed here in Colorado for that. But since I already had the flights planned, I said, I'll just go and visit the family anyway. So I'll get to Baltimore wasn't too long after I had arrived, then the client completely canceled the meeting, even the phone version of the meeting. And I found out that my mother really did need some things at that time. And so my brother, oldest brother and I, we were providing those things she needed and working on her accommodations and so on and so forth. And it was during that week that my mother got sick and went to the hospital. Now, she had gotten seriously ill and gone to the hospital before and had been unconscious before, like she was at this time. 
And so there was no reason for me to think that this would be the last time in her case, because there had been other times that were like the last time and that were very frightening. Although in this particular scenario, this was the last time. And she was in the hospital in ICU for a couple of weeks. And I remember talking to my father during part of it, and my parents were divorced at the time. It came to a point where I had to decide, should I go back to Colorado? I don't know if my mother's going to come up out of this. And sometimes she had been in these unconscious states for maybe a week or two, and it was unclear when she would come out and so on and so forth. I had clients lined up back in Colorado I was supposed to work with, and I couldn't decide if I should leave or go. When I looked at flights, the flights were all reasonably priced. so I could easily fly back in a few weeks if I needed to come back and so on. And I talked to my father about it. He said, well, do whatever you think is best. You can stay here as long as you want. And my father and I have always been very close. So I knew that was not an issue. And as I prayed about the situation, it seemed to me that even though things from a natural and physical perspective looked like it would make sense for me to leave and return, I strongly sensed God saying, stay. And I stayed in Baltimore and my mother died in less than two days. And by the way, when I made the decision to stay there, it was then that I received the peace of God in my situation. Prior to that, I had been troubled because even when I was looking at the airline fares, oh, yes, I could go home. I could you know, postpone this client. I could do a lot of things. And I didn't have peace with any of those decisions. Once I made the decision to stay, the peace flooded over me. So I canceled the job that I was supposed to do put my return trip on hold, told United I would, didn't know when I was flying back. So then when my mother died at that time, then I ended up having to stay there uh, through the time of the funeral and so on and so forth. What I realized was I was there at the moment my mother left this earth. That was an important aspect because I knew my mother was a type. She didn't want to die alone. My youngest brother and I, he and I were the two family members who were present. So I was there with her. The last words I heard her say before she went into the hospital, she talked to me about what a great daughter I had been to her over the years. And the blessing of that in my life subsequently was amazing. So these were tough situations that I'm sharing with you, these three losses of close family members. And yet I could see that there was not random activity God had orchestrated all of the events to have me in the right places at the right time. And so even now, if it turns out that I'm not there and someone leaves, then I understand that if God had wanted me there, then I would be there. So I have total peace and I have hope in every circumstance and every situation that he is working it out for my good, even if it doesn't look that way. So it's important for us to reverence God as greater than our circumstances. When I think about David and he was fighting Goliath, most of the people in Israel were afraid of Goliath. Mighty men of valor and warfare didn't want to deal with this giant Goliath. However, David said, I have fought the lion, I've fought the bear, and I've defended my father's you know, sheepfold from these intruders. And this giant Goliath will be just like one of them to me. And he fully trusted that God would give him everything he needed to slay the giant. And of course, we know the story that with the slingshot, he fired that slingshot and killed the giant with one stone. And that's amazing. But he didn't do it in his own strength, God gave him everything that he needed. So we have to remember that God is the one who is the source of our strength. And with him being our help at all times, we can have all hope. And Isaiah 26, 3 says that he will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him. So as long as we keep our mind focused on God, no matter what our circumstances are, and we magnify God over our circumstances, we can see hope no matter what the circumstances are. So as we close today's segment, I want to share two readings with you 
that come from the book of Romans. And the first one is from Romans, the fifth chapter. And this will be verses two through five. And it says, through whom also we have access by faith and to this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So keep in mind, our tribulations are producing perseverance. Perseverance is developing our character. And from that comes hope. And that hope doesn't disappoint us because remember the love of God is infusing that hope. It is the hope of the glory of God that we have anyway in the circumstances that we face. So I'll turn now to Romans 15 and we'll look at verse 13 here. And it says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So just notice our joy in peace is in believing and in believing in God, the God who actually is the power that fuels our hope. It's by his Holy Spirit that we have hope. So as you are in the workplace, as a marketplace ministry leader, remember you are bringing hope even to those who may not know God. You are bringing hope because of your connection with God and your connection with his Holy Spirit. And God is filling you every day with his hope and with his peace. And as your cup overflows, you are able to pour out to those around you, even as Paul was able to comfort those in the ship that was breaking apart on the sea. But he knew from God not a man would be lost on that mission, and that they would ultimately get to their destination, even as they had to stop in Malta along the way. So when you are on the ship, when you are on the boat, the people around you are preserved because of God preserving you. Thank you.